so uh, good afternoon everybody and uh, welcome to marcellus's uh, little champs webinar so today we have a company that has made a lot of money for our clients over the last four years and we are privileged to have tarak patel here uh, tarak patel as everybody knows is the managing director of uh, of gmm fordler so i have the rather superfluous job today of introducing tarak patel and the way i uh, if i if i was in a cocktail party with tarak i would say meet one of the few people in india who have quadrupled revenues in the last three years. I don't know, there's too many people who've done that. Tarak Patel and GMM Fordler, to their immense credit, have quadrupled revenues. I think before three years ago, of when I first met, four years ago, when I first met Tarak, revenues were around 500 crores. Now uh, they're uh, gunning out around 2,500 crores per annum of revenues. Uh, beyond being the managing director of GMM Fordler, Tarak, has, uh, Tarak is also a keen uh, 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 scuba diver is uh, keen about protecting marine life. I didn't know that uh, till we did some research on him. He serves on the board of Reef Watch Marine Conservation and the Charutar Arogya Mandal. Uh, in terms of education, uh, uh, very well educated university Rochester, BA in economics, and then an MBA from uh, London Business School and Columbia Business School. So welcome to our uh, Little Champs webinar, Tarak. Uh, thank you very much for making time for this. I'll now hand over to Little Champs fund manager, uh, the smiling assassin as promoters call him, Ashwin Shetty. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Saurabh. Uh, just a correction, actually. It's a Rising Giants uh, webinar, uh, even though we owned uh, GMM Fold, Fodler across both our uh, Rising Giants and Little Champs, uh, uh, Little Champs portfolio. Uh, so, uh, really a pleasure, uh, Tarak, to have you today uh, with us. Uh, but before I start uh, 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 with you, uh, just a couple of uh, points I have to make. One is uh, that uh, uh, obviously we own uh, G at Marcellus, uh, we have invested in GMF Holder, as Saurabh said, across all our portfolios. And Saurabh, Salil, and me have, uh, in our personal capacities, invested in Marcellus funds. Uh, so, we are also the shareholders of uh, GMF Holder in our personal capacities uh, through our investment in Marcellus uh, portfolios. Uh, and secondly, just to give outline of the session, so we have Tarak uh, till 6 p.m. Uh, today. Uh, so uh, we will have, uh, we'll divide it into two parts. So initially, we'll ask him uh, ask him uh, some questions uh, surrounding the uh, the acquisitions, which has been one of the important uh, growth strategy for GMA Folder. And then uh, after 20, 25 minutes, uh, we will uh, uh, ask the questions uh, put forward by the audience. So that will be moderated by Salif. Uh, so, uh, if you could, folks can just you know uh, put your questions to Tarak in the Q and A box, uh, it will be it will be very helpful. Uh, so, Tarak, uh, 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 the reason for uh, choosing uh, the uh, the dwelling deeper into uh, the acquisitions uh, uh, as a strategy for GMA Folder is, uh, as Saurabh said, uh, the revenues of uh, GMA Folder has increased multifold. Uh, so if I get my numbers right, <laughs> so the revenue of a GMA folder was around 300 crores in FY16. Uh, that has gone up to 2,500 crores in FY22. Uh, uh, so nearly 8x. Uh, and uh, if I see one equation itself, a folder international equation has contributed nearly 75% of 75% uh, of this incremental revenues. And if I in fact consider other acquisitions, uh, it will be many. Uh, it will be significantly more. Uh, so, given that acquisition has been uh, such an played an important role in the fortunes of GMF Holder, particularly in the recent years, uh, so we thought that we will dwell deeper into this aspect of GMF Holder. Uh, so, maybe a good point starting point uh, would be to understand, you know, the key rational thought process uh, across uh, various acquisitions. Maybe start as early as uh, Mawak, which uh, we did in uh, FI 2008. I think it was your early early days in GMF Holder, and then the more recent ones like Holder International, DDPS, and so on. Firstly, let me uh, thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure to be uh, on this chat with all of you. Just one complaint that I have on a lighter note is that, you know, not many people know us today as GM and Fodler. Uh, we know we are known as Mr. Saurabh Mukherjee's chemical picks. So I think that's the only downside now. I've lost a little bit of identity since uh, our company was part of the Marcellus the portfolio. So hopefully we can get our identity back over the next few years. But really nice to be uh, amongst all of you. And thank you for having us. So maybe I think starting a little bit about acquisitions and how it's played an important role for, for us here in GMM. I think, I think aspirationally, we always had an aspiration to kind of become a multinational company. Uh, for, a, you know, for a company, especially in the engineering space, there's always the aspiration of kind of exporting, right? Exporting is obviously very lucrative in terms of margins. And from very early on, we always wanted to kind of enter into European and US markets, right? Um, doing it directly from India, obviously, uh, 
was a bit of a problem because you know one is that by the nature of the business that we're in, a lot of travel needs to happen. Customers need to come to India. They need to come and visit our factory multiple times. FATs are done here. The final checks are done here. So having a, you know, a local manufacturing or a local kind of a factory in Europe or in the US is always very, very important, right? So you get the best of both worlds. You get the low cost manufacturing of India, but at the same time, you get local represented, a local person, a local factory that you're dealing with, right? So the comfort levels, uh, will increase significantly. So from very early on, I think that was the idea. And to get a foot in the door in the, the, Euro, the European market, we did our acquisition of Mavag in 2008. Uh, that company, when we bought it right before the financial crisis, was about a four or five million Swiss franc company. Uh, today, it's about uh, it has a backlog of close to 43 million Swiss francs, right? So that company, we've not added a single person. They still have about 30 employees, but we've grown revenues uh, about, uh, you know, five to six times, right? So incredible success story for us, uh, especially in a very high cost country like Switzerland, right? So as you know, Europe itself is quite expensive and Swiss is obviously much, much more expensive. Um, I think for us also, it's kind of important to realize that for us, especially a company like us, Fordler, which is, you know, predominantly in glass line business, it's very important that we add and enhance our product, uh, the portfolio through acquisitions. Being only a glass line player would obviously limit growth. And then it would obviously, you know, kind of make it a much more riskier prospect for everybody when you have only one product going into either the chemical or pharmaceutical. So for us, and I think for the Fordler Group internationally, also enhancing the product portfolio was very important. And that kind of considers, consisted of complementary products, which obviously go into uh, the same factories that our glass line products go into. But then also kind of going up the value chain, we're trying to now get into process know-how. So with like asset recovery, with this new acquisition that we did in Italy, uh, and then with the services, right? Services, again, is very lucrative for us. We have a very large install base, more, more than 50,000 equipment around the world. So growing that part of the business becomes very, very important for us. So for us, uh, m and has been, we've done seven acquisitions uh, since 2015. Uh, we have a couple of more lined up, very interesting acquisitions as well, something that will really kind of enhance as well as change the size and the scale of the company going forward. Great, great. Uh, and one uh, uh, thing I wanted to ask you, Tarak, was uh, we did uh, Mavag acquisition way back, you know, in 2007-8, and then uh, uh, there was a long gap. And then from 2019 to 22, as you said, we have done six acquisitions. Uh, so, you know, what has changed in the corporate landscape or landscape that one that so much targets are becoming available for acquisition and secondly, what has given us confidence, particularly in the recent years. Uh, so to do this sleeve of acquisitions that we have done. So I think every country has its time and I think it's India's time now for sure. Uh, China had maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago, they did a lot of acquisitions in Europe, especially in Germany. Uh, you know, the companies in the cement mixing space, a lot of Chinese companies were coming out and buying companies and assets in Europe. I think today it's definitely India is the flavor of the month. I think Indian companies are looked at very favorably. I think uh, our standing also across the world has changed significantly. So there's no, no longer looked you know, down upon when an Indian company actually approaches you today. Uh, a lot of companies actually reach out to us. We've been getting kind of inquiries through uh, consultants and through investment bankers for acquisitions as well. And uh, India is definitely and has moved up uh, in terms of uh, being able to acquire and make good owners, right? For us, especially with the Fordler Group, we've been, you know, we've been with them for more than 30 years since 1988. So it was really a no-brainer for us. And I think one of the you know, questions that I get asked a lot is that Indian companies have, you know, haven't been so successful. And I'm sure one of the questions that you will ask me later on will be around that. So I don't want to preemptive, but I think the, you know, uh, people are rooting for good companies, long-term strategic uh, you know, investors, not short-term uh, kind of, uh, you know, I, I think they want a long-term because people want to see and, and they want stability, right? I think that's what really uh, the today uh, the people are thinking about. And once you're part of a large group, uh, then you really have that kind of uh, foundation to really build upon, right? So I think that's something that we give some of these smaller companies, and that's why it's interesting for them to become part of our group. And in particular, Fordler International, which was a significantly bigger entity, 
compared to GMM. Uh, so in that specific case, you know, uh, acquiring such a large, uh, large entity. Uh, so how did you inf- go about it, you know, in terms of thinking about the risk and uh, return thresholds, etc. cetera, like this? Yeah, so again, I think, Ashwin, it was natural for us, right? We always kind of had, you know, this idea that one day, hopefully either we kind of buy for the stake back here in GMM here in India, or we kind of acquire uh, the Fordler group, right? It's a niche business. Again, there are not too many suitors for a company like ours. So I think we were a natural buyer. And since 2015, when Fordler got taken over by uh, DBAG, a private equity fund based out of Frankfurt, Germany, uh, they kind of looked at us as long-term strategic uh, investors, right? And they wanted to pass the company on to somebody who would kind of look at the long-term uh, growth of the company, would invest in the company, would really look at growing the company, right? So I think we fitted all the kind of, and we ticked all the boxes for them. Uh, this transaction, we actually started talking about right before uh, the COVID hit. So it was uh, really, really uh, the worst timing that could happen. And we did this entire transaction. If I remember correctly, we started sometime in February 2020. And uh, over the next six, seven months, we did all the negotiation, the paperwork, multiple jurisdictions. We had lawyers from both uh, Europe, US, UK, India, and you know many other jurisdictions. Uh, and I, I, I mean, just thinking about it now, I have no idea how it got done, but it got done, right? So it was very complex. Uh, and um, in doing a negotiation for such a large transaction over Zoom, not the easiest thing. You know, you, you don't get body language, you don't get reactions, but, uh, you know, in hindsight, it got done and it got done quite well. Um, and I think since then, I think the really heartening part is that the business has really turned around, right? So when we acquired the business, $175 million, one year after acquiring them, they, you know, they clocked around $225 million for a European business to have 20 plus percent growth. Uh, is fantastic, right? And even this year, if you see the quarterly results, uh, they've been doing exceedingly well. Uh, the two new factories that we have in China and Germany uh, went from loss making to profitable. Uh, the momentum is picking up. Uh, the order intake continues to remain very, very strong. Uh, so all in all, we've been very pleasantly surprised. Uh, most of the synergies that we are expecting have come much faster than expected as well. And you know, it's just a great foundation to build on. And on the soft you know, in terms of people and the softer side of things, I think uh, the reaction has been fantastic, right? Uh, people are so happy. I think they were all rooting for us. They wanted somebody who, you know, understood the business, would invest in the business. And I think that's what they got, right? So I think overall, it's been a great success for us. Yeah, yeah. And generally, some insights into how the whole uh, m process works in GMF order, like, uh, say, there will be a lot of uh, companies that may be coming into... Uh, yeah as a target, but how, like, what are the key parameters that you look in? Um, how is the overall, basically, decision you know, taken before you pull the trigger? Yeah, so I think we're trying to structure this process more. I think it was kind of done a little bit uh, in an unstructured manner, but, you know, uh, the top management would really drive some of these discussions and interactions and things like that. But from a board standpoint, we've also been pushed now to kind of look at specific areas that, you know, will add long-term value for the company. Uh, you know, we've always been against acquiring market share because market share, you know, something that when you acquire, you pay a lot of money for, but you don't end up uh, getting all of it, right? So I think areas where we want to focus are obviously technology. Uh, if there are complementary products that can really add to the portfolio or new markets that we currently have no presence in, right? So those are the kind of broad areas. Uh, we have bought uh, the capacity in past. We have bought out a competitor here in India, but it was an asset deal. And that gave us ready-made capacity in Hyderabad, which is obviously, like you know, a very uh, important market for us. Uh, we also kind of uh, acquired another factory in Ahmedabad uh, recently. That was, again, uh, uh, the enhancement of manufacturing uh, the capacity for our heavy engineering business line. Uh, so we've done that here in India because, you know, it's actually speed is very uh, important, right? How quickly can you put up these facilities and start manufacturing? Uh, versus like spending uh, two years buying the land, putting up a new facility, then you kind of lose that window, right? So speed was important for us. But overall, I think the idea today is to really add technology. We've done that uh, with the asset recovery business. We've now done that with uh, hydro air research, which is membrane uh, the technology, uh, entering into new areas like bioplastics, uh, green technologies, uh, mock meat, things like that, right? But otherwise, I think the idea is to really focus on something that will add value. 
and we want it to be complementary, right? So we don't want a whole new different sales force coming in, new people, new regions, new markets that we don't understand. We're trying to focus and remain uh, where we currently have a very strong footprint in. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, while the target uh, may look good from the outside, but uh, when you actually acquire it and start integrating, uh, you actually uh, come across a lot of uh, kind of issues. So in, the, in this context, uh, uh, any challenges that uh, GMM faced, you know, uh, 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 integrating particularly the entities uh, in diverse geographies, you know, any learnings, any challenges? Yeah, so I think there were a lot of learnings, but I think I think the way that we did it was we kind of uh, you know allowed success to build success. So we were not overimposing when it came to kind of the pushing uh, these synergies and initiatives down anybody's throat. We wanted people to kind of kind of see these benefits come up themselves and then kind of build on that. Right? Uh, we obviously set some you know uh, KPIs. We had review mechanisms. We had a steering committee. Uh, we had regular reviews. We also had an incentive program where we kind of aligned a lot of the senior managers across the globe through an ESOP program, right? So 47 employees now directly have alignment uh, directly to GMM share price. So they are incentivized and motivated to kind of uh, build on some of these you know, initiatives that we've been speaking about. But I think some of these things came naturally to them because they were already facing problems selling into certain markets where now you know product made in india or from brazil or from china becomes much much more easier to sell right there is a price conscious market where forward doesn't have a strong presence and these markets can really be penetrated by product coming in from lower cost countries so that's worked out quite well uh, the complementary products obviously is great now because the idea of a sales guy is to really shake the tree and kind of uh, get us as many inquiries so that's working out quite nicely and i think you know just having global alignment between the different geographies kind of you know kind of helps us so i think you know maybe just for an example i'll kind of give you uh, maybe two examples where the whole strength of the group has really worked out quite well one was a, a large project in the us a latex manufacturing plant set up by the government there this was because of covid and they actually wrote to for the us saying listen we need these glass and equipment uh, it's going to be a very fast track project. We need it in eight months. Uh, can you do it for us? And Ford said, unfortunately, no, we're booked out. We can do it for you, but it's going to be 16 to 18 months, right? Which was completely not acceptable. However, they gave them an option of bringing it from India and they were okay with it. And all these equipment were completely made in India, shipped from India, uh, sold by the local sales force in the US. The servicing will be done locally. And we got the same prices that a US made equipment would get, right? So fantastic margin for the group. Similarly, we kind of recently got an order for about six, seven million dollars from a company in China called Heng Li. Again, local Chinese sales force. The process engineering came from the US and the manufacturing is done here in India, right? So we can really give the customer what he wants. In this spe specific case of China, the, the two other competitors were from Europe and they were about 25 to 30 percent higher than us. Um, and here, you know, we, it, it, it works out well when the entire group has come together. Uh, and the manufacturing done locally in India gives them the cost advantage. So overall, we would prob you know, prob probably make a lot more margin than if we had made these equipment anywhere else. So really a lot of different kind of things coming together. And I think the idea is really the flexibility that we can offer as a group. And I think people have kind of taken to that quite well. Uh, and there's no saying no now, right? There's no option of no. We can always find the right solution for you. Great. And uh, coming to the management side, uh, one of the uh, biggest reason why most of the MNS don't work is uh, uh, there is no adequate scale up on the management bandwidth side uh, where the focus get uh, kind of uh, uh, diverted across uh, many geographical units. Uh, so in this context, uh, how has uh, GMM uh, rejected the organizational structure to, uh, to manage a much uh, bigger and uh, geographically spread and complex organization? So uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think just to reiterate again that we haven't lost a single employee since we took over. So that's a great sign. I think nobody want. I mean, pe the people wanted an owner like us and they feel very comfortable continuing to be part of the organization. So that's a fantastic sign to go and to move forward with. What we've done, uh, Ashwin, is we've retained management, right? So the European team and the international team rather still remains the same. We have a CEO and a CFO internationally and we have a CEO and CFO in India. 
Uh, maybe going forward, that's not the perfect solution. And maybe we would have to rethink about that. But for the time being, until stability is still the most important part for us, right? So to have stability, and many of these acquisitions were done by the management in Europe. So they need to be responsible for turning these things around. At the same time, the uh, the Indian team is more focused on the acquisitions here in India, the Watwa acquisition, the Hyderabad acquisition. So I think we've kind of separated the tasks quite well. Uh, but the good thing about these acquisitions besides the Fordle acquisitions, are they, they're quite small, right? They're in the $5 million odd range, 5 to $10 million range. So the risks are not that high and they're smaller teams, right? So we don't have to deal with very large groups of people. Uh, so the integration, I think, has been quite smooth. I mean, some of the deals that we've done, we bought Interseal, it was about $3 million, today $10 million. We expect Hydro Air Research, which is about $8, $9 million, to be about $20 million in a few years' time, right? So small size and scale, but good potential to increase the revenue, grow the revenue, and increase the revenue at least two to three times. That should be the, uh, be the target. Okay. And uh, what is the role of Tarak in the, uh, this uh, reject organizational structure? So. So I think the role of Tarak is to, like you said, go and have some beer with the folks once in a while, <laughs> uh, kind of give them a pat on the back and uh, just make sure that they feel that, you know, management is involved and management is kind of, uh, you know, supporting them. I think that's important. So I think most of the uh, factories that we've been to, we end up having uh, a barbecue, a lunch or a dinner. So kind of get down to the worker level and really meet people and tell them that, listen, we're not here to change a lot of things. Don't worry. We're not going to move all the production to India, give them some job security, uh, let them know that we'll be investing. I think that's another very positive thing that we've done. We've, we've seen investments and these factories have not been invested in for many years, right? So a new furnace in Brazil, a new furnace in the US. In China, we did a kind of a project to kind of input uh, throughput. We've given a new capacity in Germany as well, right? So when a worker or when a, you know, a factory level person sees this, it's definitely motivating. And they finally feel that now somebody's reinvesting in the business versus in the past where it was just lay as low as you can and let's get on with you know, as much as business as we can, but don't need to really step up and kind of you know, go that extra mile. Okay. And Tarek, you talked about uh, uh, these acquisitions, uh, plugging a lot of uh, uh, product gaps that you had, even geographically speaking. Uh, but still, you know, uh, anything that you find in uh, there, where there are still you know spaces for you to fill in, kind of uh, in your portfolio. Yeah, so I think we have a very clear idea in terms of creating a new platform. I think we have obviously, like you know, the glass line platform, the non glass line, the systems and services. Uh, currently, we are working on creating one more platform that I believe personally can become as big as Glassline. Uh, that's something that we are working on. We have a couple of opportunities that would make us the global player. Uh, there are maybe maybe one or two global players, and I think there is a vacuum in this space, and I think that's something that we are working on. Hopefully, over the next few quarters, you will hear from us on this. But uh, again, from a margin profile, from a complementary product, uh, and the technology product, I think it's a nice product to have. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to clo close out these transactions uh, in the near future. Okay. And just the last question from my side before we move on to the audience question is, uh, uh, given the state of acquisitions we have done in the, uh, in the last two to three years, uh, will, we, will we be uh, kind of consolidating for some time now? I think you talked that there is something in pipeline, but generally speaking, you know, uh, will we see some consolidation? be consolidating and taking a breather. Yeah, so I think so. I think as a group, we've kind of realized that we'll now kind of only make acquisitions when they're completely necessary and they really add value. But again, like I mentioned, it's not taking away that much bandwidth currently, right? These are small acquisitions, like even the hydro air research has 11 people. They have no manufacturing. So we don't have to worry about any of that. Uh, they will just continue to get more orders. What they want is leverage of the global network, which they will get. They want low-cost manufacturing in India and China, which they'll get. So there's no real bandwidth there, right? The local guys and the person that we kind of did this acquisition with, the CEO, is very capable of growing the business. And he needs only maybe a few engineers that kind of can add another $4 or $5 million worth of sales. So these are small acquisitions and quite easy to kind of grow to double or triple in a short period of time. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Tarek. Uh, over to you, Salil. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Ashwin. Hi, Tarak. Uh, 
Uh, there are a lot of questions coming in. Uh, we'll start with one, you know, for a big picture uh, question. This comes from Anirudh Dutta. And, uh, you know, he takes off from the statement that you made about uh, India's standing is changing, right? Uh, so his question is that, you know, what were, say, some of the disadvantages or handicaps that Indian companies had, say, 10, 15 years back? Uh, and what has really changed for uh for Indian companies, specifically for uh, for say companies in your space, uh, that led uh, to this confidence of now going and scaling up the business. Are there any specifics that you can think of? So I think I just uh, from a brand India perspective, I think India is now definitely more acceptable. I think generally Indians uh, across the world now bring a lot more power and I would say uh, status now. Also, like you know maybe earlier on, you know, just traveling to countries, uh, Indians had more maybe uh, difficulties, but now, you know, even with our, the passport, the visas available, it's, it's just a lot easier, right? But I think from a standpoint of having large multinationals from India that have made acquisitions internationally, the size and scale of Indian companies that have now kind of grown into, I think that's something that obviously has, I mean, I mean, uh, the people around the world have noticed this. So it's something that uh, will continue to kind of uh, improve and increase. But I think what we've also done is our quality levels have improved significantly, right? So, uh, you know, we no longer kind of produce the quality that was not acceptable in, Euro in European markets. We have the skills and capabilities. I mean, all the the car companies, the forging companies that export into you know, Europe and Germany, our pharma companies that export into Europe and the US, the chemical companies that export into Syngenta and the buyers and the BS of the world, we've now been we've now we've now have an acceptable kind of quality level, right? So that makes it a lot more uh, interesting. Um, but at the same time, I think even access to capital, right? I think Indian companies today can leverage their balance sheet to make these acquisitions. So it's not that we don't have the financial muscle. Uh, which we do now, right? I think that has been a big game changer because early on, even to make small acquisitions was kind of tough. But today, companies of e even the smaller sizes today can make uh, acquisitions across the world. So I think that's something that has changed as well. Right. Uh, and, and another part of Anirudh's question is on, I think you, you alluded to technology uh, evolving in India, right? The quality parameters uh, uh, being acceptable to Europe. Now, uh, a lot of that earlier, you know, we were constrained by the fact that we did not have the technology in India. Because so today, uh, you know, what capital goods or equipment machineries that you use to that you import today, you know, has that proportion changed over the last ten years, uh, or do you think we are still deficient in some of these areas? So I think India has always been different. I think if you compare India and China, China always used to buy equipment from Europe, right? Even today. Uh, 30% of Germany's output, formula Germany's output goes to China. Right? While in India, mm -hmm. the Indian companies do not buy any European glass line reactor, right? So everything is made locally. So that's always been a big difference between India and China. But today, to be honest with you, when we have foreigners visit our facility here in India, they just get blown away, right? So we are, India facility is probably the best facility in the group. And this was not the case 10, 15 years ago. We, we make 250 equipment a month, while this is more than the rest of the Fordler group put together, right? So in terms of size and scale, we've completely kind of changed uh, the way that we manufacture these. I mean, it, it's crazy, right? So even today, when I was in Germany or the US, they still have those, you know, weekly meetings where they all stand on the shop floor. They have this big board and they move these round kind of red dots across. We don't even meet anymore. We actually just do everything online. We have a Google sheet. People fill up their stuff. People don't meet at all. And this is when we make 220. They meet when they make like five or seven or 10 equipment a month, right? So uh, from that standpoint, I think Indians and you know have really changed. And I hear this with a lot of companies, you know, companies like the Mothers and Sumi as well. I mean, their manufacturing facilities are world-class, right? And now we can teach the rest of the world how things should be done rather than the other way around. Yeah, that's interesting. Right. Uh, Tarek, the next question is about, you know, uh, is about appetite or I would think it's about risk-taking appetite. Now, uh, DDPS, Vatwa were local, something which, you know, you could have managed this uh, uh, near shore. 
right? Acquiring a parent uh, is probably one rare example that we have seen uh, here, right? Now, when uh, the proposal came up uh, within the company, either at the board level or the executive uh, level, uh, in, how did you guys have the, if I could use the word, guts to really go ahead and do that? Amount of objections, if internal, yeah, the risk that you talk yeah. about. Yes, no, no, no. So, so obviously, there's always, you know, being a very conservative family. I mean, we used to be debt free, right? We didn't take a single rupee of debt until we did this acquisition, right? So, there's always uh, sleepless nights, but I guess, uh, you know, you just have to take the leap of faith because otherwise, you can't really change your size and scale. We were an India centric company, we would have always, you know, kind of remained that way. Like, you know, Saurabh said in the beginning, we've grown revenues four or five times. We would have never been able to do that if we didn't kind of take that little bit of uh, risk, right? But again, I think it was a measured risk. I think what really worked in our favor was we knew the people, uh, we knew the business, right? So it wasn't that we were going to find a lot of skeletons in the closet. Uh, we knew that it's not going to be something that we don't understand, right? We know Glassline so well, and we've been working with them for so long, so we knew where all the issues were, right? So I think it was a calculated risk, but if we had to buy a company of this size and scale that we had never worked with, I think things could have been very, very different, right? Knowing Fordler for more, more than 30 years, I think that really, really helped us kind of take that final decision that's saying that, you know, let's go for it. Uh, here's a question with there are a couple of related questions one is from ashish arora uh, and you know you specified about what technologies or products or new markets that would be the considerations when you look at an acquisition and not necessarily markets uh, but when you talk about financial parameters so, i mean do you have some say a payback period or a targeted return on capital roi metrics that you look at uh, and in case of where you are today you know, how do you see that are these numbers panning out say over the next four five years yeah, so I think at least, you know, three-year payback is something that at least at a minimum level is what we're looking for, but most of these kind of turn around much, much faster, right? Since they're quite small, and I think as soon as you get the Fordler brand and the Fordler global network, uh, the inquiry levels, the opportunities just increase maybe, you know, four or five times, right? And then kind of using the local, uh, you know, sales force to kind of clo close out some of these deals, you will see a significant improvement, right? So I think even without trying, in some cases, you will just see the kind of business, the opportunity levels, the inquiry levels to increase significantly. Uh, the idea is to be able to kind of cater to these, right? Because as soon as you get a lot more inquiries, you need to hire a lot more people to kind of put out these, uh, you know, offers on the table. So I think we'll be a little bit careful. And again, you know, salespeople by their nature will kind of bring you everything, but you need to really pick and choose the ones that really will, your, your chances are quite high of winning that business, right? So I think we're being a little bit careful on that front. But in terms of payback, I think um, three years is something that we're looking for. Uh, when we do asset deals like we did in Vatwa and um, in Hyderabad, I think we had mentioned six, seven, maybe nine months for startup, but we got them up and running in maybe two and a half, three months, really, really much faster than expected. Even in Hyderabad, we were expecting a much longer turnaround period, but it was you know, way quicker than expected. And that kind of really helped us grow our market share in the South as well. Similarly with, with uh, the Vatwa, uh, within I think two or three months, we were ready to go. So I think in all cases, we've been quite proactive and we kind of pushed uh, just to make sure that we get the factories up and running. Otherwise, it's just, use, you know, the capacity going waste. Yeah, right. Uh, and related to the, uh, this is a question on, you know, uh, uh, you mentioned for, say, Fordler International, you go there, you, you know, talk to the people, make sure that basically you don't disrupt, right? That's the uh, what, yeah. what they're doing. Uh, but in India, when you're acquiring these facilities, uh, both of what DDP has got to uh, have been through, you know, serious uh, trouble, right? Uh, uh, so operationally, what do you really need to go and do where instead of a nine-month uh, target, you can you know, turn it around or get it up and running in two and a half months? So if there are any operational, specifically some people that you send, uh, framework that you have? Yeah, so we had a lot of interaction between our folks in Karamsa and Hyderabad. And I think the first month that we had production or the second month that we had production in Hyderabad, we already kind of crossed the numbers that uh, the older owner had throughout its 10 year career here, right? So we, we kind of were kind of surprised that, I mean, it's not rocket science, but I don't know how, I mean, what we did differently, I guess it was just kind of having the right people 
and the right uh, the motivation right uh, in the first year of uh, production for the whole year i think we doubled the revenue the maximum revenue that they've had since they were here in, since 2012 right so in 8 years what they could do we did in a matter, in a matter of years so there was regular interaction uh we also kind of used karam sir to drive some of the processes in hyderabad to set that up uh we transferred a lot of people so we had a strong team of young mbas and uh, the engineers that were working in operational excellence uh in uh, the gujarat facility we transferred three of them in hyderabad full time um and then obviously we brought in local people as well but we had regular interactions and travel between the two facilities uh, early on we were ordering material in karam sir for hyderabad but now everything's independent of each other uh, but yeah definitely a lot of help and support required to start up uh, but now i think they are kind of independent and they continue to perform quite well All right uh dark uh... Uh, for the international right you mentioned that it has uh, turned out to be uh, in the turn around has turned out to be pretty well uh, but now you know do you see risks emerging uh, fears of recession energy crisis uh, china you know to really sure what's happening within the country uh, so maybe should we be worrying more about these acquisitions now and maybe had a good feel on already that's going to an end no i think yeah, there's obviously uncertainty i think energy costs in germany and uk are definitely a concern but i think uh like with every business there'll be ups and downs but i don't see this to be a long term issue i think we've taken steps already internally both in terms of controlling cost uh, reducing maybe the working days that we have in germany just to make sure that we have the best efficiency of the factories uh but i think the government also will kind of have to play an important role in terms of reducing its energy costs right but i think it's a short term problem um i still don't believe it's going to have a major impact in the overall the performance of the group that sometimes is also kind of helps because you have such a large group right so even if germany didn't do that well uh china us and all the other facilities will kind of make up for it uh, luckily for us the furnaces in japan are uh, electric they're not on gas so that's definitely a plus point uh but uh definitely the high energy costs have impacted profitability in both germany and uk but uh, overall the performance of the entire group uh still remains very strong right uh next you know, we have a couple of questions uh which said that now you know you're a global entity uh you know you, you guys have roots in glass and equipment and now doing a lot more beyond uh, beyond glass line uh so how do you kind of create some competitive advantages at a global scale uh in businesses outside of glass line and within glass line you know is there a way you're thinking of consolidating your uh, your current position maybe even strengthening it as you go ahead right so we recently had a you know analyst day which you were there for selling and again in glass line again having a market share close to 40% uh growth of growing market share is not really something that we're really trying to do obviously there are markets that we don't have a strong presence in and we'll try and penetrate those markets but the idea really in glass line is to grow profitability and we do it by two levers one is obviously buying from india so low cost sourcing from india and two is obviously operational excellence operational excellence just quickly is turning around the german and the chinese facility which we have done and over time these will even improve even further because the more uh, the output will keep increasing right the momentum has picked up and it will will continue to do so in terms of low cost sourcing that's worked really really well for us uh, we are just currently shipping out the last six vessels of a 28 vessel order that germany has placed on india these vessels will be stocked in germany in the plant in germany and as soon as a customer in germany or any other part of europe has a breakdown we will ship out these reactors immediately so one you get a premium you don't have to wait 12 15 months to get a glass line reactor and two you you know you kind of in- help increase market share as well and that's worked out really well um the budget for the f- entire year we was about 4 million dollars of india sourcing we've already crossed that budget in the first uh, first quarter of this year right and we have a i think the pipeline is close to about 15 million dollars of indian made equipment going into europe right so that's picked up really really well really really been successful and that's only europe uh, there's southeast asia there's us that's also go, uh, you know that's ongoing 
in the glass lines uh, in the non glass line space the idea is to grow revenue again we have small businesses here uh, that have a very low and small market share so growing these businesses is much much easier for us and these are new areas that we are entering into systems business like i said also similar so asset recovery is another big area for us we recently uh, received a large order about 23 crores from hindalco so this is completely a new business area for us so they had an you know uh, the alumina plant they had a, uh, the captive uh, the power plant where they you know where where they had uh, sulfuric as uh, the sulfuric gas going into the atmosphere so they wanted to kind of capture this and convert it into sulfuric acid that's where our plant comes into play so they signed a contract with i think a us company who in turn gave us the sulfuric acid concentration plant and if this works out well they have nine more of these plants so, so this could be a new industry that we never even kind of thought about or catered to right so there's multiple uh, things that are ongoing and then with this new acquisition of hydro air research uh, we're trying to enter some of these new age industries right so uh, the lithium extraction uh mock meat right so we are working with impossible foods uh and guys like that and once you have one successful installation then many of the other guys will just kind of come back and say listen i want to you know i want the exact same thing that you sold to so and so uh bioplastics again so these are all new age industries green technologies that hopefully over time will pick up and those would be nice growth areas for us and then lastly on the services place and this is just for a context Yeah. uh services account for about 40% of revenue uh in the international business in india it is only about 10 or 11%. So in india we want to grow services but internationally also services will become profitable because one we will source spare parts from india and two we made some recent acquisitions one in the us uh, to really grow our services business right. So overall that's really the idea and when we add new businesses it will fit into one of these buckets right and then either it will help improve profitability or it'll help improve revenue and like i said the growth areas are the systems and the non glass and business because that's where we have very very small market share All right uh you know you you so mentioned just one cl- clarif- clarification question to tarak so tarak uh, if you guys make glass line equipment in india uh, that can be sold in europe right it doesn't need a clearance from the european regulators uh, because the european pharma industry or the european chem industry will use it No, so we have all the accreditation, sort of. We can pretty much supply anywhere in the world. We can supply into Japan. We have GIS into Europe. We have the DIN and the CE marking, and in the US, the ASME. What's also worked out really well for us is we've been liaising with the government to get approval. See, every glass line equipment because it's dual use and can be used for the wrong stuff like chemical weapons and things like that needed approval from the government of India. Uh, they would actually call a meeting at DGFT, and they would get at least five or six different uh, the departments coming in and signing off. But now we've got clearance, a blanket clearance from DGFT to basically that when we supply into any of our group companies, we don't need this license, right? So that's a huge breakthrough for us. So now that we are supplying these twenty-eight vessels, we don't need to let the government know beforehand where these vessels are going. We only need to tell tell them once they are sold. and uh, we just tell them which customer has bought it right so it's a huge breakthrough for us otherwise we would have to wait for an order we would have to give them a name of a customer what this customer is going to be making and they would go through maybe six seven month kind of a window to kind of get clearance for this and just to just to therefore they clarify further uh, other indian glass line equipment manufacturers i presume they don't have all the global accreditations and they clearly won't have the sort of a uh, uh, government waiver that that you were just discussing Yeah, so that's prob- probably right. Uh, there's only one Indian manufacturer who has a factory in Germany. Might get it for Germany, but definitely not going to get it for the rest of the world, right? Uh, but that also, I think, right now, it's only the approval that's come is only for GM and Fordler, um, and we have the ability to basically supply to any of our facilities around the world. Very interesting. Salil, back to you. Thank you. Uh, so, Tarak, you know, I, uh, on the response to the earlier question, you mentioned mock. meat is something which you're working with and i think there's a lot of curiosity that some two three people asking that you know, what exactly are you guys doing with mock meat it, it doesn't seem to fit anywhere into the product portfolio yeah so this company that we bought is basically in membrane separation technology and this is how you create protein from different kind of so you need to get that same kind of feeling of meat of blood of milk 
And that comes from these different chemistries, right? So you want that kind of redness to come into the meat, the little bit of that blood dripping. I know it sounds a little bit uh, not very nice for vegetarians, but that's exactly how you make mock meat, right? You want it to look, feel, and taste as close as possible to real meat, right? And this is where the membrane separation technology comes in. The other area that this company also does a lot of work is in uh, the penicillin. And maybe this is a nice st uh, story here also for, your, uh, for all your viewers is that recently there's been a big push to make penicillin here in India. So we used to buy all our penicillin from China. The government of India has launched a PLI scheme to make Penji here in India. There are two massive, uh, there are three massive uh, plants that are up and coming, two in Hyderabad, mm -hmm. one in the north. And we've sold mixing systems to all of these. And our orders are in excess of maybe 60, 70 crores of rupees, right? And only for penicillin and only for the mixing, because these are, these are all large fermentation tanks, right? 3,000, 4,000 cubic, uh, 400,000 cubic meters, right? Wow. And, and again, we were the only company in India who had technology. The other two vendors were from Europe and because they didn't have local manufacturing against from a cost to competitive standpoint, we were, we were much, much better. But if this was the business that were to grow, we would definitely have a very strong footing here. And then after making Penji, there's, you know, and you make antibiotics and stuff, that's when these membrane separation technologies come in. Yeah, great, interesting. I so hope uh, viewers have uh, you know have the answer to that curiosity. Uh, Tarak, one question I'm sure you must be answering this uh, almost every day and maybe even discussing it internally is uh, there are a couple of questions on on demand in the end user industries, right? Uh, uh, so China dislocation uh, is being talked about. Uh, there apparently are two schools of thought. Somebody says that it's going to be you know decades before there's any meaningful shift happening. Uh, you know, others think uh, it's not the case. Uh, and now there is also this talk of Europe plus uh, one, right? There's a new kind of concept which has come in. So if you can, you know, when you think of end user demand, uh, where do you see chemical pharma, say, over a five-year period? So I think we are bullish. I think chemical continues to remain very, very strong here in India. I think uh, Indian companies have now reached that size and scale where they'll continue to grow. Uh, you know, I meet with the uh, CEOs and owners of most of these big companies, SR, FPI Industry, Deccan, Davies, on a regular basis. And I think all of them have investment plans uh, that will kind of pan out over the next few quarters. Um, pharma has been a bit slow, uh, to be honest with you. Chemical is really driving a lot of the investments here in India. Pharma in Hyderabad area has been decent, but again, for the rest of the pharma, uh, I think they have definitely slow, slowed down, but I think over the next maybe a couple of years, there should be a picking up in terms of pharma. Uh, what's interesting for us is that the rest of the world has seen significant investments, right? So Europe and US, and Europe more so, uh, has seen significant investments in pharma and in chemical. Like I mentioned to you, our Swiss subsidiary, which is about a 25 Swiss, uh, the million Swiss franc, has a $43 million backlog. That's like a two and a half year backlog and they're still getting new audience, right? So people are planning for three years. Most of our Fordler units have a nine to 12 month backlog already, right? So there's investment definitely there. And this is something that we've not seen in the past. Will it continue for a long time? You know, we all hope so, but with the, you know, with the uncertainties in Europe, I'm sure that things might kind of slow down for a bit, but I think over the longer term, I think you will still see uh, investment. You know, we've, we've been hearing stories of the, you know, the French government, for example, saying things like just set up an API plan and I don't care what you manufacture, just set it up, right? So that's the kind of um, sound bites that we're getting from, uh, from Europe. Uh, and China still remains the world's largest producer of chemicals and will do so, right? So I think China will come back stronger. But then I think the push here in India is always to be self-reliant. I think people have realized that they were over-dependent on China. I think they will kind of build and backward integrate. So I think from a business standpoint, I don't see a really you know downward cycle in terms of investments. I think that will only go up. Just uh, Tarek, if you don't mind my stepping in there, you know this uh, this the, these long uh, order books, these backlogs that you guys have. Obviously, when we first researched. GMM four years ago, that was one of the things which gave us a lot of visibility on the sheer strength of uh, your franchise. But just sort of thinking ahead a little bit, 
if you sign up today and you actually deliver two years hence, right? And say in that interim period, raw material prices go up. Are you able to pass that on to the customer? Yeah, so in Europe, definitely, yes. Uh, it's built in. They have these escalation clauses. If there's a change of 5% or more, they can definitely go back and talk to the customers. But again, you know, uh, most of these are done on job work costing basis. It's not a price list. So they will do a costing. And then based on that costing, they will order the material at the, you know very quickly after the order comes in. Maybe the material will not be delivered immediately, but will come in exactly when they need it, right? But in the case of Switzerland, uh, most of the work is done here in India. About 70% of the manufacturing is done here in India. So uh, from that standpoint, we make sure the material comes in pretty early. So there's not a big impact if the material cost were to change significantly. Thanks. So I'll back to you. Uh, there are one uh, piece, you know, there are a couple of questions on this is, uh, in these acquisitions, this acquisitions is about integrating, say, research and development, right? Uh, uh, so if you can give a sense of how this was done earlier, so the R&D and uh, engineering, right? For Because these are all customized jobs. Uh, how are you doing it, say, before Fordler became uh, a subsidiary? And uh, how is that changing now and into the future? Yeah, so that's something that we're working on. I think early on, every country or every geography did their own R&D. Uh, and India would kind of wait for something to be developed internationally. And then we would ask them for it, right? So that was pretty much what R&D we did. But today, I think there is a definite push towards moving R&D and engineering both to India. And from an engineering standpoint, I think we want to build a kind of a resource here in India that can kind of support the entire group. It should not be something that's you know for glass line or for non-glass line. It can be something that will for the entire group. So it could be a systems, you know, you know, kind of a drafting of engineering drawing. It could be P and ID calculation. I mean, I don't know what, but that's something that we definitely want to do. Move an engineering office. I think good company Sulza has done it for many years. I think that's one area that we can definitely save costs. And then to move R and D to India as well is another area that we believe uh, you know, can really help us save a lot of costs. Talking about r and I think R&D is something that is very important for us. We are currently working on some new launches, uh, especially in the glass line. And I think I've spoken about this. We have this new glass that we are working on. It's called the Smart Glass. Uh, this is an ESG-friendly glass. So the current glass has uh, heavy metals in the form of cobalt. The new glass that we plan to launch will be heavy metal-free. So none of the heavy metals will be part of the customer's final product, which obviously is great from that standpoint. Plus, from an environment standpoint, much, much easier to dispose of or to recycle, right? So I think that's something that hopefully in the next couple of quarters we'll be able to launch uh, and would give us a definite edge compared to our the competitors because it's something that we will be the first in. If it's going through the final test in terms of corrosion resistance and things like that, but we are quite confident that this glass uh, will uh, be something that will kind of be a game changer for us. Salil, you're on mute, Salil. Yeah, sorry. Uh, is there some, say, IP protection for all of these new, uh, in, do you quantify, let's say, there are any patents that you file? Uh, uh, yes. If you can so we have patents for all the new, yeah. So I don't have the exact numbers at the top of my head, but most of these have been, you know, a few years in the works. So we have worked with universities and with, you know, uh, the technical institutes. Uh, we have IPs and patents formed for all of them. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, sometimes our competitors would bring something to the market which would be similar to ours, but not have the technical specifications that are the same. But that's something that we'll have to sell and speak about. But generally, for most of our, you know, new technologies, we have. Uh, IP and patents in place. Great. Uh, Tarak, now, you know, one question Ashwin already asked you this uh, on increasing the management uh, bandwidth, right? Uh, uh, and you explain how, how you guys have gone about doing that. Now, one question that has come is on, say, the next uh, generation or the next level of uh, leadership that uh, the GMR might have because of the sheer scale uh, and breadth of your operations. Uh, so at the board level or at the you know, top management level, how are you thinking of, say, shaping the next generation of leaders? And uh, are there any conscious uh, efforts being taken on building a culture? Uh, because you know, Germany, Switzerland, China, you know, India, there's going to be a lot of diversity you know, from that point of view. 
Yeah, sure. So maybe starting with the board, we've completely revamped the board from 2015 onwards. Uh, the earlier board was very transactional and we used to have meetings and the whole meeting was spent on really just signing off on the accounts and things like that. Today, the board is much more involved in strategy, into long-term decisions, M&A opportunities and all of that. So we've really professionalized the board now and we plan to do it even more. We have a new vacancy opening up. Uh, and you guys have worked with our ex-chairman, uh, the Dr. Sivram, again, somebody who's been with us for a long time. He retired recently, and now we've taken on board the chairman of Kotak Bank, Mr. Prakash Apte. He will take over as chairman. Uh, so we have a very strong board in place. In terms of management, this is the first time in the history of GMM Fordler India, 60 years of our history since we got incorporated, that we now have a professional CEO. Asim Joshi joined us about a year ago. So the day-to-day -day operations of the company have been left to Asim and Manisha CFO, and they're doing a fantastic job. Uh, sorry, what was the last part of it? It's on culture building, right? You know, such diverse right, right. operations across yeah. the world. Yeah. Yeah. So on a culture building, we recently also launched our global brand architecture. So starting with a common brand for the group, the main decision was, should we call the new company GMM Fordler? Should we call it Fordler and then have Fordler India? Uh, but it's nice that everybody wanted to bring both the companies together, GMM and Fordler. And now every company across the world is known as GMM Fordler Italy, GMM Fordler India, GMM Fordler the US. And that's really, really nice. Uh, and people love the new logo. They resonate with it. And it's a really nice, clean, fresh look. And along with that, we kind of launched a kind of a brand, uh, how do I say, like a theme, right? So it is so, so, so something that we call big moves. And now we are kind of trying to bring that big moves into culture and how it's going to impact the way we behave both externally and internally, right? So that's something that we're working on. Um, and I think that's something that Fordler probably did not have much of. So HR and culture building was something that was not done at all. And that's one thing that I believe personally is an area to get people to really kind of feel and kind of be part of the organization we need to spend more time in. And that's something that we will definitely do. And hopefully, you know, we can bring these people into one common kind of one Fordler, one GMM Fordler environment where they all strive towards a common goal and a common vision. Great. Uh, folks, we have time for one last question. So, Tarak, uh, you know, this is, uh, again, two, three people have asked this, uh, uh, Amit and Nirudh uh, being two of them. Uh, it's question about how are you kind of spending your time? You know, you have uh, answered in parts about what, how the leadership is building up. Uh, so, one is specifically, how are you spending your time? And second, more specifically, is from a risk management point of view, and right? one is what risks uh, do you see that need to be monitored? And uh, how are you putting in place a framework to kind of mitigate or control them? So I remember sort of telling me that I should parachute into these different geographies and then <laughs> kind of do the same thing that I did here in India. I remember coming to my <laughs> office and telling me that. So unfortunately, I haven't done that yet, but I've definitely gone and visited these facilities a lot more. Uh, but again, I think uh, it's important that, you know, my time gets spent on really long-term strategy, um, you know, having a long-term vision document. That's something that we just came out with a few years, uh, you know, a few weeks ago. So that's something that is now done. Uh, I will now spend the next maybe a few weeks kind of aligning the rest of the organization to this vision document, kind of getting it more granular in nature and understanding what we're going to do in these different areas, regions, and platforms. Uh, we also completed some uh, acquisitions, like I mentioned, the, you know, the balance 46% of Fordler International uh, being a related party transaction. That was something that had to be very much above board, transparent. So we spent some you know, time doing that. That took a bit of my time. But I think going forward, I think the push is going to be obviously to grow market share, to grow revenue, to grow profitability. I think we've reached and we've built a strong foundation now and some of these HR software aspects is something that I would like to spend my time on to really motivate the team so they kind of you know go a little bit of the above and beyond their normal I think they've been kind of used to being staying below the radar I think a little bit of push to help some of these people to kind of really uh, you know stand out I think that's something that will help the organization in the long term 
and and risks would you like to comment on yeah that? sure so so on the risk front again i think that you know we have a quite a strong risk framework in place um, you know obviously there are risks associated with new new products or new technologies that could replace glass client uh, so we are kind of at the you know you know at the forefront of that so we are already working on continuous flow reactors if the batch process were to kind of change to continuous flow, we have something already in place. We are doing trials for new technologies. So we're always, you know, kind of working there and trying to kind of increase and enhance the product portfolio. Uh, from a risk standpoint, particularly uh, at an operational risk standpoint, you know, obviously the current situation in Europe is a bit of a dampener, but hopefully that would kind of, uh, you know, uh, be correct over time, but generally the other risk that we have in terms of safety, in terms of you know, I think our standards are quite uh, you know high, so I don't see that as a major risk, and we don't have any hazardous material that we're dealing with on a regular basis. So I think otherwise, I think we just need to focus on maintaining cost, uh, you know, making sure that we don't increase cost significantly. And we look at low cost countries to build and create more manufacturing capacity and over time reduce manufacturing capacity in high cost countries. I think that's really going to be uh, the driver for us. Great, Tarak. Uh, you know, as always, uh, it was really great speaking to you. Uh, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Uh, so, Tarak, I was going to suggest, given how hard you guys had worked, that perhaps a, a, a go off site for the entire consolidated uh, uh, EMM Fordler group is warranted. But then I remembered you're a scuba driver. And <laughs> even an amateur like me, I've been snorkeling in the and Andaman and Nicobar Islands once. It's gorgeous. So uh, uh, we, we hope that the entire consolidated global team uh, uh, of GM and Fodler gets, gets some uh, well-deserved rest. And, uh, hopefully a great yeah. So it's a large team now. So it's going to be quite expensive. So we'll wait for you know margins to improve a little bit and then kind of do it. So maybe sure. in the next couple of years. <laughs> so that ROC and that margin will only go in one direction. Thank you very much for your time, sir. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank nice. You. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Zach. Uh, so, folks, sorry, I uh, uh, forgot to inform at the beginning that uh, we'll have an, uh, a Rising Giants update uh, after the session. I think, uh, but anyways, who have logged off, I think uh, we get a recording uh, in YouTube and Marcellus website. Uh, so, let me uh, let me quickly uh, give update on the Rising Giants portfolio. Uh, uh, so, let me share the presentation. So yeah, so I'll keep keep it uh, quick and short. Uh, so coming to the written part, uh, uh, um, so we had uh, uh, since the last time we spoke, I think uh, we have recouped a lot of ground. I think at one point in time, the portfolio since inception returns were down uh, more than twenty percent. Uh, so we are kind of uh, half uh, recovered around half of that. Uh, and the last two months uh, have been pretty good for the portfolio. Having said that, you know, there's still a number of stocks that you can see on the right-hand side. Uh, there are still uh, kind of uh, deep in the red. Uh, but as we have been uh, reiterating about the portfolio stocks, so we remain very convinced about the fundamentals of these companies. And uh, in fact, some of the names that you see in the bottom of the right-hand side table is one of the largest allocations that we have in the portfolio. So very, very convinced about the fundamentals of these companies. We believe this share price of this uh, companies have been uh, impacted due to near-term noise, quarterly results, and so on. Nothing uh, impacting, but structurally impacting the fundamentals of these companies. And whenever you are seeing any uh, any opportunity because of the share price dislocation, because of this noise, news, etc., uh, we are, uh, in fact, increasing the positions in the stocks. For example, uh, we have been buyers for Dr. Lal Path Labs and LNT Technology Services over the last uh, three, four months uh, given the share uh, a sharp uh, correction in the sh their share prices, but no change in their intrinsic valuation in our model. Uh, so that is, and coming to first quarter, uh, the first quarter results generally for the rising giants portfolio companies have been pretty strong. So if you can look at the median uh, earnings uh, uh, top line uh, EBITDA and PBT for the portfolio level, uh, it shows a strong YOI growth. And even on a quarter on quarter basis, uh, uh, despite fourth quarter being seasonally strong quarters for most of the companies, even when we compare first quarter FY23 results with the fourth quarter results, uh, there is an improvement uh, improvement for most of the companies and even at the overall portfolio levels. So uh, this suggests that uh, the, the, the impact of commodity cost, et cetera, which supply chain issues, which impacted third quarter, fourth quarter results of last year, 
uh, that seems to be that issue seems to be kind of uh, getting resolved things seems to be uh, bottoming out and when you compare the rising giants median uh, portfolio earnings with that of the bse benchmark bse finder there is a lot of disparity so definitely these companies are gaining market share and some of the capital allocation initiatives which i'll talk about in the next slides they have started contributing to the top line to the earnings of these companies so definitely earnings are on upswing for this uh, for these uh, companies and some of you may say that you know uh, the last year base was quite benign because of the covid second wave i think the operations for some of the companies would have been impacted uh, for first quarter but uh, so even if we ignore that and we look at a little bit longer term trend for 3 years say uh, comparing the 3 year basis so there is a strong 17% uh, growth uh, at the portfolio level even on a pre covid uh, first quarter fy20 that is uh, june 2019 quarter on a 3 year basis we have delivered 17% earnings growth despite all these challenges surrounding covid as well. uh so so that is on the uh, earning side and but the bigger story is uh, uh, forget about the quarterly earnings is the things that uh, these companies have done in the last 2 2 th- 3 years so we uh, uh, we actually listen to tarak speaking about gmm but uh, that is a story for uh, almost all the other rising giants portfolio companies uh, so these companies have uh, really uh, stepped up uh, capital investments carry investments in the last 2 to 3 years for example in fy22 itself despite all the head means all the gloom and doom uh, the amount invested by these companies are actually uh, nearly twice than what they typically used to invest in the uh, invest in say fy19 to 21 period so nearly twice uh, these companies invested and uh, many of the investment that these companies have done for most of these companies have been a game changer for example for gmm obviously from a single product single geography they expanded to multiple product multiple geography in the last 3 years uh, dr lal pat labs again uh, largely was largely present pre covid in north and east but by virtue of their acquisition of suburban last year they have got a foothold in the lucrative western indian diagnostics market uh, similarly for vmart actually uh, largely earlier present in uh, up and bihar north indian states but last year they acquired the unlimited brand of stores from arvind uh, fashions and by acquiring th- that it has got a foothold in south india similarly suprajit uh, acquired a large automotive cable company in europe and by doing so Uh, the world is the market for now super its uh, automotive cable business uh, so we have seen this uh, huge capital allocation and ashwin if i can just sort of chip yeah. in there folks uh, folks if we look at the table that ashwin's giving you on the right hand side look at that fy22 column right look at the big entries right look at the people who are making massive capex bets in fy22 a dr lal with 933 930 crores the suburban acquisition suprajit 760 crores the uh, uh, kongsberg acquisition Uh, 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 alkyl 250 crores the uh, plant expansion astral poly 340 crores uh, that's salil that's a plant plus an acquisition uh, astral 340 crores yeah yeah yes it's a new yeah. business so uh, these guys right this these are not these are not your run of the mill average indian crony capitalist type people these are some of india's smartest capital allocators right we've, we've met them over many many years over 10 years 15 years 20 years these promoters have shown that they are very astute about when they load up load up on acquisitions and capex and what what that fy22 column is telling you that india's smartest promoters are telling you that this is the time to put chips on the table this is the time to acquire this is the time to build new plants and it behooves us as investors as fund managers to highlight to you what ashwin's table is telling you that they are putting 2x Uh, 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 on the table in terms of capex compared to what they have done in the preceding few years more than any federal reserve or rbi policy or union budget or any b- broker or uh, 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 strategist telling you overweight underweight follow the money follow the smartest promoters in india as they load up on capex and this table uh, uh, is telling you in a nutshell all you need to know about making money in this country yeah thanks sir uh, so yeah so that is basically be, uh, by uh, much of this capital allocation uh, uh, and the investments uh, we remain very sanguine about the prospects of these companies for the next 3 5 10 years so as i said like uh, most of uh, the things that these companies have undertaken in the last 2 to 3 years they have significantly uh, significantly expanded the growth runway for these companies significantly expanded the addressable market for most of these companies geographically or into adjacencies uh, so gives us a lot of visibility about the uh, earnings of these companies then what was the situation 2 years back so through covid actually these companies have only prospered uh, uh, but uh, and also uh, 
uh, acquisitions have been an important integral part uh, uh, was there in the previous slide also, but specifically in this slide. Uh, so acquisitions has not only GM has done this, but uh, a lot of these companies have done acquisitions. So acquisitions have been an integral part. Uh, I think also what has happened in the last two years is because of COVID, etc. the weaker players really are not able to sustain. So the supply of targets or acquisition uh, candidates for acquisitions have also increased. And rising giants companies have really latched on. To that opportunity and when you actually acquire when the chips are down uh, it also you get uh, uh, companies at a really reasonable valuation or cheaper valuation than the, uh, the case when it's a very hot market basically but uh, one uh, questions which we have encountered surrounding specifically the MA acquisitions done by rising giants uh, during our recent investor meet is that uh, uh, again you know traditionally indian companies have not been very successful uh, as far as uh, mergers and acquisitions are concerned. So should we worry about uh, the uh, the integrating integration of this acquisition? Should we worry about the size of these acquisitions that is made by the rising giants companies? While this look very good on paper, but uh, we'll, you know, uh, we should be, should we worry about uh, the actual execution of this acquisition? So uh, what gives us confidence about uh, rising giants uh, merger and acquisition strategies? Uh, first and foremost, you know, uh, uh, they have been very, uh, uh, taken very calculated risk. So they are not kind of uh, 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 eaten more than uh, they, that they can chew. Uh, so very sizable acquisition. So that you can judge by the terms of the total size of the acquisition relative to the capital employed. Uh, so that is in uh, that is in uh, column five. Uh, so for barring for uh, Dr. Lal Patlabs and ICSL Lombard, uh, the size of an acquisition relative to the existing capital employed of these companies have been very, very reasonable. And also in case of Dr. Lal Patlabs and ICSI Lombard, the number looks high because uh, these are asset light companies. So at asset light companies, may basically your net worth of capital employed typically is very low. So acquisitions typically when you make it looks uh, high from a, uh, optically from when you compare it to the size of the capital employed. Uh, but when you look at the uh, post debt equity of these companies after making the acquisitions, you'll find that even after this acquisition for most of the companies here, they have surplus cash on the uh, cash on the balance sheet. So, from a balance sheet uh, perspective, uh, uh, even after this acquisition, so they are net in cash. So, that is again that the kind of uh, dice down the risk. And uh, lastly, uh, about the valuation of the acquisition, last column, goodwill is a very good measure. You know, uh, goodwill is basically uh, what is your purchase consideration and how much of your purchase consideration in excess of the. Uh, the uh, the assets that you are acquiring, we'll find that for most of the companies, again, goodwill is significantly lower. And again, uh, in case of Dr. Lal Patlar, the goodwill looks optically higher because uh, uh, for when you are acquiring a brand, basically there is no manufacturing asset. Uh, so Dr. Lal Patlar acquired suburban uh, diagnostic. The assets, hard assets are very limited. You are actually paying more for the intangibles uh, like brand, goodwill, etc. So again, that number looks optically higher for Dr. Lal Patlar. Uh, but uh, as far as risk thresholds are co co concerned, uh, rising just really tick that box. They have taken very calculated risk. And second measure of uh, uh, risk when you are making an acquisition is uh, whether you are actually playing a turnaround game. Uh, in that case, actually your risk increase is manifold. But uh, uh, in case of rising giants companies, the companies they have acquired really are not uh, deep into the losses. There is no turnaround bet. These companies are actually making profits. So as you can see in the EBITDA column, most of these companies are actually making, already making profit. What actually rising end companies uh, will do is basically invest into these companies, like Tarak talk, talked about GM folder, invest into these companies, uh, basically, uh, uh, backward integration, karo, synergies, law, etc. And thereby uh, make these companies even more, even more uh, beautiful. Uh, but really, they are not uh, kind of uh, betting on turnaround of this uh, turnaround of this company. It's basically increasing the size, scale, and efficiency of this company. So here also, uh, when you look from that perspective, the risk is really very, very uh, reasonable. And uh, uh, third point is basically uh, the companies that they are acquired, <clears throat> they are largely acquired either into the same businesses or uh, or into uh, growing the adjacencies. It's not that these acquisitions are made of completely unrelated business where the risk significantly increases, but they are really uh, made acquisitions uh, where they are paying to the strength. So most of these companies are either expanding geographically uh, the rising giants markets or basically uh, into adjacencies where you know more products is getting pushed to the same set of customers or same distribution channels. So again, uh, these kind of acquisitions where it is into the same business or related business related to the existing business, the chances of success are, uh, uh, are higher 
than compared to what if it had been an unrelated business acquisitions. So this also gives us a lot of confidence uh, about the success of the M&A. And lastly, uh, the management bandwidth. So again, you heard about GMF, but uh, again, most of the companies have also, uh, rising edge companies have also kind of even scaled up on the management's bandwidth. Uh, so for example, Suprajit uh, got, uh, uh, before making the Kongsberg uh, LDC acquisition, they already got a veteran uh, global automotive uh, uh, cable uh, person on board to manage that acquisition. Similarly, Dr. Lal Path Labs also got a person to head suburban diagnostics from within and so on. Astralis also contribute, continued with the existing existing management of gem paints, for example. So on the management bandwidth side, uh, also these companies have scaled up to manage a much bigger entity, a much complex entity, a much geographically uh, spread entities uh, than they, they were before. So this also gives us a lot of confidence. Uh, so, so we are quite gung-ho, we are quite sanguine about the prospects of the rising giants companies for the next uh, three to five years. So here I will stop and I will request Salil if there are any questions, if you can put it forth. Yeah, so if, uh, if you guys have any questions on the portfolio, uh, then please put it in the Q&A box and uh, Ashwin will try and answer as, much, as many as he can. So Shin, one first question is, I mean, have you added any stocks, any changes in the portfolio in the last, uh, or since the last update? Uh, so obviously we'll talk about rising giants here. Uh, so rising yeah, giants, so there has been no change. Uh, obviously we increased the positions within the stocks, as I talked about. Whenever, for example, a share price has corrected significantly or has increased significantly compared to the model portfolio, we make that interesting rebalancing between the portfolio stocks, but uh, uh, no new stocks added since we added VMAT uh, in sometime in March, uh, and uh, there has been really no change, addition or exit from the rising nice portfolio. Right, thanks. Uh, we'll just give it 10 15 seconds for some of the questions to start coming in. I think one of the things worth highlighting, uh, Salil uh, uh, and Ashwin, you know, you guys can perhaps take a couple of stocks and do this, which is that, you know, how we analyze whether these acquisitions are adding value or whether these are, you know, promoters making imprudent bets. So perhaps, uh, you know, Salil, you could take the example of uh, the flurry of acquisitions uh, GMM has made and how you and your the, your colleagues have analyzed whether these are sensible acquisitions. Do they make sense for us as a shareholder to load up further or should we, should we ramp down? And perhaps Ashwin, you could take uh, Suprajit and uh, what Ajit Rai Ji has done and how he made the, uh, the, the Kong's girl, Kong work call. Uh, because that will give a client's clarity on how we think through promoters' capital allocation calls. Sure. Uh, but on, on, on GM and Ford, you know, uh, the first thing that uh, you Nashwin know, in a way alluded to when he was speaking about acquisitions, the first thing to do is that uh, we try and see where that acquisition is being made, right? Is it completely unrelated or as the adjacencies are you moving up uh, the value chain? Or are you you know integrating either forward or backward? So that's the that's the really the very first test. The second test, which equally if not more important, is to see what is the quantum of capital that is being uh, uh, you know bet uh, on this acquisition. Uh, if uh, I mean, are you kind of putting your whole balance sheet at risk, or is it a calculated kind of calibrated uh, bet? So in case of GMM, uh, you know what we've seen is that. Uh, the acquisitions that have been made have actually been uh, done. Both one is in adjacencies. Uh, in fact, actually not even adjacencies, the directly related businesses, right? So you're buying out the competitor's factory, the only other MNC competitor's uh, factory in India, right? You are adding uh, plug and play capacity. You are getting access to a market which is a large pharma and chemical uh, belt in India, where so far you did not have a presence, right? Uh, and then you're doing it for just about 50, 55 crores, right? So all the three kind of tick marks that right? you are doing make strategic sense uh, and you're not betting your balance sheet uh, on this. Uh, similarly, you look at uh, the, the heavy engineering acquisition that they bought this factory in uh, in Amdabad. Uh, again, they bought it under the bankruptcy uh, law. And so you know, it, was a, it was a, it was kind of uh, just the assets, you're not buying anything else. Right, uh, that was again bought for about 50 55 crores. Uh, you're getting large scale heavy engineering fabrication facility, 
again plug and play which frees up your capacity in existing plants in in gujarat to do more of glass lining uh another remarkable thing about these acquisitions have been that these are asset acquisitions so you're not buying the business right uh, so you're not buying customers because you're selling to the same customer there is no point in buying a business where there is an acquisition of a existing customer right you might as well get access to new markets and second is there are no liabilities that come with this right so because you are not taking on customers and neither are you taking on employees so you don't have any liabilities uh, either of the past or of uh, you know of, of continuing uh, nature that those come with the business so you're buying clean assets uh, that is what is most important and then the largest acquisition on the fodler uh, piece itself uh, in the first acquisition they did for just about 27 million dollars right so buying a global G, uh, glass lining uh, giant actually not a glass lining we are afraid to call them glass lining giants these are chemical process equipment players so you buying one of the largest in the world a 54% stake for just about 27 million dollars right so again strategic sense you're not bidding the balance sheet right uh so that is when at the time of acquisition and then obviously you need to keep doing continuous monitoring uh so gmm if you look at pure numbers uh say between fi 19 and 22 uh, they have done four acquisitions tarak mentioned seven the three have happened a little later uh for these four acquisitions these guys spent about 340 345 watt crores right uh and the incremental ebitda if you look at that these guys have got their share of ebitda they have got from 9 f19 to f22 Now that implies uh, an ROC of upwards of thirty five percent, right? So that really tells you that how smartly these guys have played, not given more than what these assets are valued at. In fact, they've they've gotten it actually pretty attractive uh, uh, valuations. Uh, so that's the you know kind of whole way in which uh, we look at acquisitions at the time of acquisition, and then continuous monitoring to see if uh, both the strategic and the financial objectives that behind these acquisitions are they turning out to be the way. Uh, they should be. Ashwin, to you for uh, Suprajit. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so more or less similar uh, around uh, around uh, along similar lines as uh, uh, Salim talked about GMM. So Suprajit also. Uh, so first was on the size. Uh, so Kongsberg was around four uh, hundred uh, crore EV uh, enterprise value acquisition. So Suprajit already had three uh, hundred crores of cash. So the incremental that uh, that they had to take was uh, very minimal. so nothing really putting anything uh, big at stake uh, very reasonable in terms of size second was uh, uh, very related business uh, kongsberg makes automotive cables so prithit has been making automotive cables all its uh, kind of uh, life so very very uh, related business in fact what kongsberg brings additional to suprajit is that suprajit is traditionally very strong in uh, kind of control cables etc whereas uh, kongsberg is very strong in the uh, body cables uh, the door cables etc so suprajit uh, it really doesn't cannibalize suprajit's exports but uh, actually gives an opportunity to suprajit to push its uh, traditional control cables more into the kongsberg's uh, client base basically it can mine get more from kongsberg's client base for its existing products uh thirdly was uh, it uh, uh, gives opportunity to uh, uh, make use of suprajit's uh, very strong uh, backward backward uh, backend basically suprajit is one of the most uh, kind of frugal organization a very efficient organization that has been its key competitive advantage so it really actually gives an opportunity to cater to europe uh, high cost geographies uh, gives an opportunity to now get a very efficient low cost backend in india to service the european customers so that that can also bring in a lot of uh, synergies and uh, margin improvements in kongsberg and lastly on the management bandwidth as i said like uh, they already got uh, jim ryan on board even before making the kongsberg acquisition in fact jim ryan used to work in kongsberg uh, around 4 5 years back so he knows the business in and out so really that will also help uh, having uh, him on board in terms of integrating uh, the acquisition of kongsberg uh so yeah thanks guys thanks and folks if you guys uh, like understanding how smart promoters load up and uh, load up on on acquisitions and capex at the right time and how they ramp down at the right time then the definitive book is uh, william thorndike the outsiders 
uh, and the, the the promoters' names, the CEOs' names that my colleagues just referenced, they are India's outsiders. They don't spend too much time listening to the gumph that uh, our conventional uh, finance media and uh, banking broking community churns out. They use their brains, they use their business dhan, their dhande bazi ka brains, and they ramp up and ramp down very smartly. And you and I benefit from that by buying their shares. Um, so back to you, Salil, for the Q and A. Thanks. Uh, so there was actually sort of one question on what book you are reading right now, but I guess uh, this book you read years ago, but it would be a good uh, suggestion for, for the people here. Uh, Ashwin, one question is, there's one question on VMAT, and uh, you said F22 had a negative uh, CFO. So if you can confirm if that number is right. Uh, and if that is the case, then, you know, why? how does that fit into uh, our investing framework in general? Uh, why are we still holding on to it? Yeah, yeah. So obviously, uh, uh, cash flow operation is an important parameter that we see, but uh, we are not so obsessed about yearly numbers, right? Uh, because uh, for genuine reason, uh, yearly numbers that can see fluctuation. So whenever we kind of build quant filters for selecting stocks, short, li short listing stocks, it is based on six years or uh, six years or a little bit longer term time period where we look at the cumulative numbers because uh, working capital uh, 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 and cash flow operations can be quite volatile year on year. Uh, so we don't pay undue attention to one year uh, numbers. Having said that, specifically in the case of VMAT, as for in fact most of the rising giants companies, even little giants companies, uh, these companies actually loaded up on inventory because when we were in March, there was still a lot of uncertainty surrounding uh, raw material price increases, uh, a lot of uncertainty surrounding supply chain. I think COVID had not uh, kind of uh, gone, uh, so just not as uh, the environment as it is right now. So most of these companies actually, given these uncertainties, are loaded up on, loaded up on uh, inventories. So across the board, there is an increase in the working capital. Uh, so as a result, that was the primary reason uh, that we, uh, also impacted VMAT in F522. But uh, we see it uh, normalizing uh, in this year. Uh, we see it kind of coming down. Normally. Thanks, Ashwin. Uh, Ashwin, then this question on... Uh, on uh, on the insurance uh, space and uh, so ICSA Lombard in particular, right? Uh, uh, so people are a little worried about stock price performance. Uh, can you give your thoughts on what, how are you looking at, uh, at you know, so, placing yeah. the portfolio? So ICSA Lombard, uh, uh, yeah, so I think, uh, 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 the first quarter numbers were pretty good, uh, the premium growth, etc. Uh, what also we like about ICSA Lombard is it's a kind of uh, entering into new business segment. So retail, for example, retail health policy, uh, where ICSA Lombard uh, can, uh, historically didn't pay much focus on. Uh, recently, they are kind of putting a lot of investments in the uh, retail side health policy. I think that is a big market uh, right now. There is very limited competition in this segment. Uh, so that we like. Secondly, uh, uh, the interest rates hardening actually plays to the advantage of uh, uh, advantage of ICICL number. Even though uh, uh, in the short term it has negative impact because your investment income is comprised of two parts. One is the coupon that you get on the investment, and second is the mark to market gain. So whenever interest rates increase, there is a one-time impact on mark-to-market uh, gain because the bond prices actually go down with the interest rate increase. But on a more sustainable basis, the coupon rates, the interest rates actually uh, increase. Uh, so we, in fact, uh, see ICC Lombard actually benefiting from the increase in the interest rates. And the whole uh, paradigm ch changes uh, recent, you know, uh, the regulatory changes that are being uh, talked about in the insurance space, like uh, requirement of KYC, uh, that actually plays to the advantage of large incumbents like ICSA Lombard because it uh, kind of gives them a lot of <clears throat> lot of data regarding the customers. You know, so there's a lot of cross sell opportunities uh, for uh, large players like ICSA Lombard. Similarly, capping of expenses on the insurance side uh, it also helps uh, ICSA Lombard and kind of brings a discipline in the industry. So you can't uh, kind of have an operating expense uh, above a particular threshold compared to the premium. So that also helps the incumbent. So we are pretty pretty confident about ICSA Lombard. Thanks, Ashwin. Uh, Ashwin, one uh, question comes from Mr. Nagpal, and uh, he wants to be sure about how do you uh, treat dividends that uh, that come into the portfolio? Uh, how do you reinvest them back? Uh, when yeah. do you do that? 
so dividend gets uh, reinvested uh, back into the back into the uh, portfolio so it's not uh, paid out as uh, cash to uh, the clients uh, unless clients uh, specifically ask for such payment but uh, uh, we it gets uh, uh, reinvested back into the portfolio stocks all right uh, yeah the then anonymous attendee asks about uh, specialty chemicals he said we have uh, one name a uh, couple of names there actually one name there uh, any views on the space uh, any reasons why there is no wider ownership in in this sector uh, obviously there is a few names under uh, under consideration which are being researched uh, so currently uh, we have alkyl amines in specialty space we have a gmf holder which is not directly specialty chemical but plays to the a uh, specialty chemical story uh, but uh, uh, you know just because the sector is uh, we uh, having some tailwind we don't kind of go and blindly invest in sector so that the stock has to clear the three c's uh, of our investing philosophy that is gov- corporate governance capital allocation and competitive advantage and uh, you know so that is kind of so but uh, to answer the question there are few names uh, that is being researched and hopefully you know we will add on uh, in the coming quarters Yeah, uh, I think we are almost out of time. But uh, Ashwin, can we just take one more question, sure. one last one? Right. Uh, this again is from anonymous attendee, and uh, uh, he's asking on specific stocks where, uh, in some webinars, there has not been too much commentary. That is on on Cholamandalam, uh, Grindwell, and uh, Relaxo. So if you can just take a quick thirty second. Uh, update yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll request uh, Salil to take Grindwell, but on Chola again, uh, very strong, uh, very strong numbers. Uh, uh, very strong uh, growth. In fact, a uh, CV business is uh, kind of rocking uh, after a kind of two to three years. So the CV is commercial vehicle is one space where there is a lot of demand which is coming in. Uh, so that is helping uh, Chola. But uh, more importantly, Chola is also kind of uh, diversified into new business segments uh, uh, like uh, consumer finance etc. Where we think their uh, their their uh, uh, the interest uh, cost advantage. that they have interest rate they get uh, lower interest rate because of the murugappa brand and uh, uh, legacy track record i think that will really help them uh, uh, succeed in those businesses uh, uh, so we are quite uh, uh, quite uh, confident about chola uh, it remains a very important uh, location in our portfolio and uh, salil you talked about second name i missed it relaxo uh, relaxo yeah yeah so relaxo is facing some near term headwinds so uh, so uh, there are the eva prices which are the key raw materials for relaxo that prices kind of uh, shot up through the roof uh, last year and relaxo increased prices whereas the unorganized segment uh, they kind of found a way of uh, compromising with the quality and not increasing the prices to the same extent as relaxo so the price gap between relaxo and unorganized segment increased and our channel checks uh, kind of suggested that there was a kind of market share loss but having said that last 3 months as the raw material prices have kind of come down uh, and relaxo has also passed on uh, the raw material price decrease and the price gap uh, has kind of narrowed down than what it was 3 to 4 months so we think that you know uh, the situation should get resolved end of the day the relaxo product offers a significantly higher value proposition to the anorganic segment while they may be little bit costlier Uh, at the outset but when you look at the life cycle of the product relaxo products uh, kind of uh, last much longer uh, so our analysis suggest almost 3x 4x than that of an organized unorganized product so that value proposition remains there is no any dent to that uh, uh, value proposition so yeah so uh, i'll i'll just take grindwell it's on on future prospects so grindwell uh, uh, as you would know is part of uh, the you know is a subsidiary of uh, say gova is a kind of global french uh, major with presence in multiple uh, businesses in india the uh, the two largest businesses are are abrasives and uh, uh, you know ceramics which largely go into to uh, manufacturing industries uh, primarily auto uh, so here they have access to you know uh, technology and a product pipeline from from their parent so there's always a technology edge uh, that grindwell has over peers and his efficiency in operations uh, uh, in manufacturing operations kind of is uh, uh, you know people who who value uh, kind of total life cycle cost they they find value in this and we see that trend actually increasing more and more uh, plus given you know where the manufacturing uh, uh, capacities in india are 
uh, going in the direction in which they are going uh, you know these guys extremely well placed to take advantage of that incremental growth uh, in addition to that you know there's they have a business called performance plastics which is largely complex polymers uh, again uh, the product pipeline that comes from uh, from the parent uh, and there are very very few players in india there are very high barriers as far as you know te- technologies or the chemistry is concerned uh, uh, which gives them kind of a really strong edge over competition uh, uh, in addition to all of this what is happening is they are kind of localizing more products uh, the parent is extremely supportive uh, so new product introductions once it reaches a certain size and scale uh, manufacturing is localized which kind of reduces cost a lot allows them to uh, reach more customers allows them to increase market share uh, so on the whole uh, you know just the fact of technology and localization plus india's manufacturing outlook is what uh, gives us uh, confidence on grand will not uh, great i think that's that's the end of it so so thank you everyone for for staying with us uh, thank you for all your questions uh, hope we have answered as many as we can if not then please you know write to us and we'll try to make sure that uh, we'll we'll come back to you Uh, you can write to us on sales at marcellus.in s a l e s at marcellus.in uh, thank you ashwin for your time thank you thank you salil thank you everybody thanks